Okay, I'm going to open Zoom to public. Public will join us on the meeting and the wait for the CTV is confirmation. Okay, uh, you could begin in three, James. All right, good evening everybody and welcome to the Calabasas City Council of April 14th, 2021. I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Tonight I am joined by uh, my fellow council members, Mayor Pro Tem Maurer, Council Members Crouch, Shapiro and Weintraub, as well as our staff. This meeting is being conducted utilizing Zoom teleconferencing. The live stream of the meeting may be viewed on the city's CTV channel three and or online at www.cityofcalabasas.com. If you plan to provide public comment, please press raise hand if you're joining via Zoom or star nine if you're joining via phone and star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the city you live in. You'll be allowed three minutes to address the city council regarding any item within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. In the event of the city, of the city council losing electrical power or suffering an internet connection outage not corrected, Within 15 minutes, the meeting will be adjourned. Any items noticed as public hearings will be continued to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the City Council. Any other agenda items the Council has not taken action on will be placed on a future agenda. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Mari Hernandez, City Clerk. Please join me in saluting our flag. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mari. All right, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I'll second that. Madam Clerk, roll call. Councilmember Kraut? Aye. Councilmember Shapiro? Yes. Councilmember Weintraub? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Aye. Mayor Bosaja? Aye. Carries five zero. Thank you. We met in closed session prior to this open session meeting. Does the city attorney have anything to report? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The city council met in closed session to consider two items. First was conference with labor with real property negotiator regarding two seven zero four zero Malibu Hills Road, Calabasas. No report of action was taken. The second item on the regular agenda was continued. The second item that was taken up was the third closed session item in the. 6.05 p.m. special meeting. That was conference with the legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation and no report of action was taken. Thank you. Okay. Now we're gonna to turn to council announcements, uh, starting with Mayor Pro Tem Maurer. Great. Thank you. Um, on Thursday, April 29th at 10 a.m., a consortium of interested groups, including Malibu Foundation, UCLA, LA County Office of Sustainability, is conducting its second assessment of how wildfires and extreme heat events are impacting our community. In this particular listening session, they're asking seniors to attend and provide their input. So again, that is Thursday, April 29th, from 10 a.m. to 11.30, go onto the city's website and you can register. We really would like to hear how evacuations, um, preparation, um, the events themselves are impacting your quality of life, your health, um, and you. So please uh, join us. Uh, we have a whole host of activities planned for Earth Week on um, April 22nd. Uh, through the 30th with the mayor and the mayor's council. And one of my favorites is the Arbor Day celebration and it'll be held Saturday, April 24th from 10 to 12 p.m. Uh, behind the Albertson store. And again, you can register online um, and go online to see all of the different activities. Thank you. Peter, I'm sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Thank you. 
Um, you know, I uh, just want to piggyback on what uh, Mayor Pro Tem Maurer shared with us. We have a whole host of uh, items going on that week. And uh, my favorite is going to be our Sunday Creek cleanup. Uh, I'll be there for the entire time with a trash bag in hand, getting dirty to make the creek clean. So please come join us. There's uh, information for signing up on our website. Okay. David? Thank you. Those are great announcements. I have one to add which is uh, April 30th, Friday, from 11 to 3 p.m. virtual uh, this year, rather than at the library due to COVID constrictions, will be the fifth annual, or sixth annual actually, Calabasas Law Day put on by the Calabasas Chamber of Commerce in conjunction with the city and the Chamber Attorney Forum. It is an opportunity for those who need to get free legal advice in all different areas of uh, interest or concern. Go ahead if you have interest in signing up or asking for a meeting with an attorney free of charge and getting free legal consultation. Go ahead and sign up through the Calabasas Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. And Alicia. Um, very exciting news that our library has begun to open. So we have limited hours for in-person service and that's Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays and Sundays from one 1 to 5 p.m. And you can go on our website if you're still interested in checking out books by appointment only, that is still available and details are on our website, but it's great that we're starting the reopening um, in a very safe manner. So that is exciting. And just the other thing that the city is doing a outdoor basket, youth basketball league for this summer. So we're happy to announce that and signups are available on our city website. So normally the city league is inside, but due to COVID we're able to do it safely outdoors. So again, thanks to staff for making that happen. Thank you. And I, uh, all my announcements have been taken and thank you very much, everybody. Um, Hopefully we'll have more announcements to make about more activities as things open up. So uh, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item is going to be oral communications and public comment. This is a time where anyone can speak to the city council on a matter not on the city council agenda, as long as it pertains to city related business. And you will have three minutes or less to speak um, please use the raise hand function as I previously outlined. And I don't see any hands raised. Um, that is correct, Mr. Mayor, there's no hands up. Okay, so we're gonna not have any oral communications or public comment because I don't see anybody. Last call, okay. So now we're gonna go to consent. We have on the consent agenda, six items. Does anybody wish to pull any of the items off of consent? Mary Sue, what items? Item number four, please. Okay, and any uh, anybody else on any other items? Okay, may I have a motion to approve items one, two, three, five, and six? Oh, oh I'll move that. Is there a second? Second. I'll sec. Okay. Roll call, please. Councilmember Kraut? Aye. Councilmember Shapiro? Yes. <clears throat> Councilmember Weintraub? Yes. Mayor Kutemauer? Aye. Mayor Busajan? Aye. Carries 5 0. Okay. Item number four is the adoption of the uh, annual investment policy resolution. Mary Sue? Thank you. Um, so, for people watching, as the mayor stated, this item was our policy uh, for how to invest our funds. And the item after that, number five, um, showed us where our funds were. So I would uh, like to ask the council if maybe on a future agenda item, we could look at adding um, something to uh, our investment policy that addresses where we might specifically want to see our funds invested and perhaps where not. And what why I thought that was on the investment report, I noticed that we had at least two um, entities in oil and gas sectors, uh, Shell and Exxon, and it contradicts what we're doing right now with our 100% renewable energy commitment and all of our other environmental um, policies. So um, 
I would just like at some point to have that on a future agenda item, looking at um, what we might specifically want to see uh, or where our investments go and where not. Thank you. With that, I will move the item. For a second. I'll second item four. Roll call, please. Council Member Kraut. Aye. Council Member Shapiro. Yes. Council Member Weintraub. Yes. Mayor Pratim Aye. Mayor Busajan. Aye. Carries five zero. Okay, thank you. It, it's approved. Uh, our next item is item seven. This is continued from the last meeting when we were all tired. This is a discussion on our 2021 socially distant events. I think Marty was going to give this report. Marty Hall, if I'm not mistaken, can you is he going to be let in? He's being let in right now. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor Bazaji and, and council members. Uh, we've been asked to bring forward to you a plan for a possible 2021 social distancing events. Uh, as you're aware, one year ago, we were hit by the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And consequently, we were mandated by both the state and the county to adhere to strict protocols. Uh, this forced the city to cancel uh, nearly all of our community special events. Although there were, uh, we were able to have some of the social events, the mandate did not allow for the three main events uh, to the city, which were the Arts Festival, July 4th Spectacular, and the Pumpkin Festival. With the ever-changing protocols, we looked ahead to 2021, and we are considering some possibilities for our community for the remaining part of the year. The department has closely been working uh, with the county's tier system for the reopening of the businesses, events, and athletics. We are currently in the orange tier. However, Governor Newsom announced that we will be eliminating that tier on June 15th, and we should be back to 100% opening. The new status makes the presented report to you a little obsolete. Uh, the community services staff is now planning on the following possibilities to serve the community. Uh, in May, we are thinking of a Mother's Day program at De Anza Park. Uh, in July, on July 4th, a concert at De Anza Park. Three lakeside concerts are being looked at, one in July, two in August. Uh, the dates have not yet been established. Uh, we are looking at doing movies in the parks rotating the parks, one at De Anza, one at Grape Arbor Park, and one at Gates Canyon Park. Uh, the Pumpkin Festival in October is a go for now. We are looking to do that uh, the third week of October. And then at the end of uh, the year in December, we will bring back Breakfast with Santa at the Tennis and Swim Center. Uh, we plan to adhere to all the LA County Department guidelines for all events. Uh, the safety of our residents and staff is always a priority to us, and uh, I'm available for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Alicia's hand up. Thanks, Marty. Thanks to all your staff for what they're doing. So I know it's hard to answer, but with things changing so quickly in the county, you heard the Hollywood Bowl is going to be opening, um, Dodger Stadium's open. What are we going to be able to do more than what we, what was just listed? And the reason I ask is because I know people still want to stay close to home, but are like craving that community feel and being able to do more in the community. So that was one thing. And then if you can just elaborate on more what you're thinking for 4th of July, and then I'll just, my third question is, would there be a way to do something with fireworks? Not necessarily having the large crowds that we normally do, but it would be a shame given all the progress that we've made in LA County to not have fireworks for a second year in a row, not be able to celebrate the fourth like that. Um, we have done some research around the area and the only one that we know of so far that is going to be doing fireworks is the Caneo Parks and Rec. 
uh, out in Thousand Oaks shooting off the mountain where everybody is, uh, will be in their vehicles. Um, usually when we're planning the 4th of July, we're working almost five or six months out. So it's, it's pretty late in the game trying to get a fireworks uh, contract and somebody to come out and do that. Uh, we're also, as you know, we do not have a special events coordinator. Um, you know, Amy Haver used to be that. She's now the facility supervisor. She's working on trying to get classes and summer programs up there. So we're, we're a little tight with that. But we could take, uh, if you really want some direction or you want to give some direction, we can take a look at uh, just a fireworks show with no, nobody in the, uh, at the school. Um, but however, if the guidelines change and uh, we go back a level, the uh, fireworks company will not refund the money. So we would put in, we would put in uh, sixty thousand dollar dollars on the line uh, by signing that contract. Uh, the event at uh, Ganza Park, we're going to it's going to be a red, white, and blue event. Uh, we will have a, a stage set up on the field. Uh, we're working on getting the band currently. We'll have a few giveaways for the uh, for the public. Uh, but again, we are at levels we have. Currently, we're looking at, we have to have every family in a pod six feet apart right now. So we, we should be at at least 67% uh, level of attendance. And we've done some research and work with Maureen and her, her uh, department on this. So that's somewhere between 500 and 800 people could attend that event. Um, but again, as Governor Newsom is making some changes, right. that all could change and we might be a little be able to go a little higher in regards to the the number of people that way. What's our normal attendance at the high school? Three thousand. Okay, so it'd be significantly smaller. Correct. I mean, I would love to just see if there's some way to have. I mean, fireworks. It would just be a shame to not have something traditional no, for the Fourth of July. Again, I mean, I understood last year, but people want to stay close and I think it's safer for people to stay in our community. So the more that we can provide them here, the better. I will take a look at that for, for you. Uh, there's an, also an alternative that we could look at a possible fireworks show somewhere in, later in the summer in August, maybe when the city is fully opened or something in regards to another event if, mm -hmm. as a possibility also. All right, Mary Sue, your hand is up next. Thank you. First of all, Marty, I wanted to thank you and staff for the wonderful um, Easter hop betrayal. It was really a lot of fun for families. So thank you for that. I think what you've described is really ambitious and um, it, it sounds like a lot. And I just am mindful of, you mentioned our staffing. So I was really surprised, especially by your announcement of the pumpkin festival. I don't know how you could possibly pull that off on such short notice. Um, and do we really want so many people coming? So I, I agree with um, Councilmember Weintraub that I think people would be very content to throw out blankets, bring their kids and their neighbors and sit and listen to music. And I just wonder if we should focus more on the scalability of events, considering that there are still so many unknowns and maybe just have concerts uh, throughout the city of different themes, a Mother's Day conference, a concert, a 4th of July. But I guess I'm just, my concerns would be the ambition and what you've just described. And, and it sounds almost like we're playing catch up. I think, again, the city, we are so grateful to be outside um, among each other that just seeing children run and play and in a park, listening to music and people dancing, I think that would be wonderful. So I wouldn't be disappointed at all to see it scaled back. And then that way we also would be better prepared if one of these variants breaks through or there's something else that we need to do to be more careful. So. Thank you again, and everyone in the department. Marty, did you want to say anything in response to that or not? 
You know, um, the Pumpkin Festival, I, I, I will say we, we normally start planning in uh, the middle of May to, to June 1, so we do have plenty of time. Uh, it is a very important uh, event, I know, for our chamber, and uh, it is important to work with Bridget Caro and, and, and the chamber in regards to that event. Uh, the event, we will, not, we will not proceed with an event, I will be honest with you, unless it is 100, we feel it's 100% safe and it falls within all of LA County guidelines. Um, so we, we would like to proceed ahead with that, uh, however, if there is a spike or if there is anything that uh, we feel unsafe, we will not let that, uh, we will not go ahead with something like that. Uh, when is your drop dead date on whether or not we have it? Probably the first week of June would be uh, something that we, sh we need to really decide if we're gonna have that. So uh, um, we, will, we can keep you all in the loop in regards to that. Uh, again, we're playing kind of a little bit off what the governor said. Uh, we will play off with the Hollywood Bowl and other major uh, venues do. Uh, we do know it will be a masked event. You, people will have to have their masks and things with that with them and wear those. Uh, however, uh, I would anticipate we probably might not be at 100% attendance levels. We might have to be scaled down to 67% or so. And uh, we'd have to work <laughs> through those, uh, those possibilities. The other thing that is a concern possibly would be the food. That, that's the one that has me a little nervous in regards to that because most of the, the stadiums and uh, other venues, the food must be delivered to you. Uh, there's no lines and things like that, but we will, we will see uh, how that plays out come, uh, I'm gonna say first week of June, we should be hearing what the governor and things are gonna come with. Okay, Peter, you're next. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, thank you to you and your your whole team for all of your efforts here. I think, you know, getting things going again is extremely important to us as a community. I was at the uh, Hop and Go Bunny Trail that you put on uh, the Saturday before Easter, and it was just fantastic. There was, uh, you know, just a great response from the community out there, and and it was a great way to get people together again, socially distant and safe. So please keep it up. Um, I did hear when you were sharing something about rotating between the parks. Were you talking about the concerts? No, I was, I was talking about movies in the parks. So uh, we have a nice uh, movie, outdoor movie projector and, and unit that we could uh, actually go to Grape Arbor, for example, set up a movie that on uh, one night during the summer and the, the local residents can come out, sit down, bring a blanket and, uh, and watch a movie. Uh, we won't be serving food or anything of that. It would just be something to come out. Then we would move up to Gates Canyon Park and then probably back to De Anza. Okay, fantastic. And any parks on the, uh, like maybe Calabasas High School could uh, could let us do something out there? Um, earlier in the day, actually, I, I was thinking besides the high school, I, I actually thought we do have a joint use agreement with AC Stell. So we could easily go up to AC Stell in the field and do it on that side of town. And uh, that's a very good point that, uh, that we were thought of this morning in regards to uh, the other part of the community. Okay, great. And then just a couple of more comments. Uh, you know, Alicia, Council Member Weintraub mentioned uh, the fireworks and, and I'm with her. I would be really excited to see some fireworks again. I've been to the fireworks in Thousand Oaks. Uh, it's nowhere near as great of a program as we have here in Calabasas, but it is convenient that you can drive up, watch the fireworks and drive out. Um, so I don't know if the city has thought of this, but you know we have uh, you know not a lot of uh, vantage points in Calabasas except perhaps shooting off from Craftsman's Corner, uh, which would be visible from the entire Commons area. Um, just something to think about if you uh, if you have the you know discussions further about putting on some fireworks. I, I like the idea this year of of getting something that's visible to everybody but allows us to keep our distance. Um, and certainly I hear what you're saying about uh, this, the, the state uh, rolling back uh, any sort of uh, mandates at this point. And we as a city need to be uh, excited about that and cautious at the same time. Uh, we need to recognize that there is a vaccine out there, but as council member Moore pointed out, uh, you know, there are variants out there as well and we just don't know where it's gonna go. So uh, just 
let's uh, let, let's hope for the best and plan for the worst. And my suggestion would be let's keep moving forward with all of these great ideas. And if we have to scale them back last minute, we have to scale them back. Uh, I would much rather see the city uh, over planning than uh, than missing the opportunity to, to get our community back together again. Okay, I will I will meet with the city manager and we will discuss that on the fireworks. And uh, I, I just have to tell you that the staff that I work with is fantastic. I'm, I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world to be able to work in this department. And every every one of them is, is a true professional and, and care about everybody in the community. And, and I thank them so much just to be able to work with them. And they appreciate all of you too. All right, David, your hands up. Thank you and thank you for I realize this report is updated and uh, ever changing so thank you and all the staff uh, very exciting a year ago we were unfortunately talking about and actually canceling uh, events for the city and uh, what a difference a year makes now we're looking at what we can do and what we can open up with um, I just want to comment quickly or follow up on the fireworks uh, sounds like there is obviously a strong desire to have that if possible. Uh, I know one thing it, it, that I understand Valley Cultural Center is Valley Cultural is doing fireworks at the promenade also on July 4th. So that is very close by and that is occurring. But other options, just throwing it out there and don't know if it works or not. I know there's been fireworks before. Uh, jointly, and maybe we could do it with them at the Commons, or maybe we could use multiple sites in the city to have events so we'd be spread out. Much harder for staff, I realize. So just throwing it out there. A um, couple more things which we, I know I brought up, I know Alicia was very interested in in the past year, and it's, and, and as things open up, obviously you can do th movies in the park and outdoors, but Still, there was a wonderful drive-in movie event for as part of our Calabasas Film Festival at King Gillette Ranch with food delivered to the vehicles as well from food trucks or food vendors. So there, it was a safe uh, item. It was hundreds of cars. It was a great movie, great place to watch a movie uh, event and get out. So even if there was a hiccup of any kind or a rollback or the variants were upsetting, we could still continue an event like that drive-in movie. Uh, event or even driving concerts. Those are the only two ish only comments or suggestions. Everything else sounds great. I hope and pray we're going to be able to go forward and keep doing more and more and, and we all get safe, safer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your suggestions. Okay. Um, I would just add that I'm, I am hopeful that uh, you can do the pumpkin festival. I think that is our premier event, our number one event. And even if it's a watered down form, just speaking for myself, I would rather have it, um, you know, in the watered down form than transformed into something else. Uh, it's also, as someone pointed out, the chamber really does rely. I think maybe you pointed out the chamber relies on this um, for a good portion of the funding and to highlight some of the businesses and uh, I, th I think we can do it. I, I, I don't, I think by May, it'll be a little clearer either way, but uh, I think things are gonna move rapidly from here. And I, I would hate to make a hasty decision to, to not have it. So I'm glad you, you, you have the luxury of waiting another, uh, you know, six weeks or so. Or actually is it six, what did you see? You said the beginning of June, right? Yeah, somewhere in the first week of June, okay. somewhere in that neighborhood, it, it could be pushed out probably till the, you know, June 15th, if need be. But, uh, I, I think people are going to be flexible this year because everyone's in the same boat. No one, the, the companies that you might be renting or hiring or doing contracts with aren't going to have conflicting events because they haven't booked anything. So I think it might be easier to, to, to do things last minute. But I don't, June is not last minute. And I think you, you can, if you can wait until then and tell us, uh, that's great. We'd love to, we'd love to hear it. Um, is there, are there any other comments from council members before I turn to the public, which I don't see any comments. Mari, did we get anyone raising their hand? We do not have any hands up, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So this is just a discussion. We're going to receive and file the rest of this report. And um, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is item number eight, 
a request for council consideration of a support letter on Senate Bill 612 by Anthony Portentino involving rate pair equity. Um, I, I Kenden or John Bingham, if, is John Bingham coming on to give the report? He is, Mr. Mayor. He has a okay. presentation. Okay, we'll wait for him to come on. I'm on. Can you hear Hello, me? Hello, John. Hi there. Um, welcome and thank you for the report and go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna share screen here and bring up the uh, PowerPoint. And can you all see that? Can yes. You, you got can the PowerPoint? You, can you go to full screen? Uh, let's see if I can do that. Hmm, it's not letting me do that right now. Maybe if Ryan is in the house, he can help me out with this. On uh, the bottom, bottom right, Jeff. Oh, uh, John. John, I, I think if you just start the slideshow, it should open it up. Right next to the from beginning. There we go. <laughs> Are we good to go now? Uh, this, uh, as the mayor announced earlier, uh, is the, we're, we're asking the council's consideration to support Senate Bill 612, which has to do with uh, rate parity. And it's a complex subject that's explained in the staff report and the numerous attachments but I was gonna go through it uh, quickly with a couple of slides. And then we also have um, Gina Goodhill, the policy director from the Clean Power Alliance is here to answer any of uh, your technical questions if you have any. Um, as you know, the city is a member of the Clean Power Alliance. Uh, Mayor, Tom, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Maurer and uh, Council Member Shapiro are on the board of directors of the Clean Power Alliance. And the Clean Power Alliance has requested that all member cities uh, support this bill. And a lot of them already have. Um, the bill concerns electrical corporations and other load serving entities and their allocation of resources. Specifically, it would ensure that the resources held in investor owned utilities uh, portfolios are managed to maximize the value for all customers and would ensure fair and equal access to the benefits of these legacy resources. Over the last 10 years, millions of utility customers, including Calabasas, have switched from IOUs, uh, investor-owned utilities, to community choice aggregates such as the Clean Power Alliance. Um, and as the council aware, as the council is aware, the CPA is the largest community choice aggregate in the country. And it's uh, comprised of, uh, I think it's 33 local jurisdictions now across LA and Ventura counties. Uh, Calabasas is a member, of course, and its residential, commercial, and municipal customers are at 36% uh, clean power by default and will be at 100% in October of this year. Uh, when, cu when customers transition to a CCA like CPA, that's a lot of acronyms, but the customers continue to pay for resources like energy that were procured on their behalf through power change in different adjustments or PICAs. And however, unlike uh, a investor owned utility customer, community choice aggregate customers receive no benefits from these resources. Now SB 612 uh, addresses those problems and it will rectify this inequity that has been exacerbated in recent years 
as the cost of this payment has risen by hundreds of millions of dollars with no sign of decreasing. The impacts of COVID-19 have made the importance of writing this inequity and lowering costs for all customers even more urgent. SB 612 would ensure fair and equal access to the benefits of resources that all customers pay for and would ensure that legacy contracts are managed in a way to, that maximizes benefits for everyone. This bill would also require the California Public Utilities Commission to recognize the value of greenhouse gas free energy in these contracts. And time is of the essence, passage, passage of this legislation is important because as more time goes by, the legacy contracts become less valuable. Now, um, in addition, the legislation SB 612 provides uh, investor owned utilities and community choice aggregates uh, direct assets customers to the right to receive legacy resources products in proportion to their load share. And it also requires the California Public Utilities Commission to recognize the value of greenhouse gas free energy the same way uh, it values and recognizes renewable energy in, and other products. Um, and it also requires investor owned utilities such as SCE to offer any excess legacy resource products to the wholesale market for annual solicitation. Um, and then I go on to summarize the bill, but I don't believe that's necessary unless there's additional questions from the council. And as I had said earlier, Gina Goodhill, the policy director from CPA is in attendance uh, and is available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this? I don't see any. Or not, Mr. Mayor. So I'm gonna turn to the council um, and we have um, somebody here available to answer questions as John indicated or John. Um, I see Mary Sue's hand up first. Thank you. Um, thank you, John, for the presentation and welcome, Gina. Gina, can you take a minute to break down what John said in plain language? Um, I will tell you why I think it's important. This is an opportunity um, for cities like Calabasas and counties that have joined the Clean Power Alliance to take advantage of some of the resources that have already been procured or plan to be procured by large investment owned utilities like Edison. These are publicly traded corporations, they are for profit and they have shareholders. And when we separated um, from uh, Edison, we continue to pay some of these legacy uh, fees for some of the procurement that they have. Um, and yet we don't have access to them. So it's simply correcting this inequity. Um, it's uh, endorsed by Senator um, Stern and many, many others he's co-authored. But Gina, can you add um, for the public's benefit just a, a minute's um, summary again of SB 612? Of course, and, and thank you so much for um, John for the presentation and Mayor Pro Tem for that breakdown. Because I, I know it, it is, um, on its, on its face, it can be a confusing bill, but I think it does do something really important. So um, when the model for CCAs was first created and legislators decided that communities could form together to create a CCA, the goal was to make sure that there wasn't a cost shift to the customers that stayed with the IOU so that they were not paying for more resources um, than they needed to on behalf of CCA customers. So the tool that was created to prevent that was called the PCIA or the Power Charge and Difference Adjustment. And basically that means that the resources that utilities procured while CCA customers were still with the investor owned utility, we still have to pay for that. And we pay for it through a monthly charge on our bill called the PCIA. That's not something that we are arguing with. Um, you know, I, I think we understand that um, 
we don't want any costs to be shifted to IOU rate payers. The issue is that we do not have any access to those resources that we're paying for. So we are paying for this and getting nothing for it. And then we still have to go out and procure these resources ourselves. So we still have to buy you know, credits for the renewable portfolio standard. We have to procure greenhouse gas free energy. We have to procure resource adequacy and it's very expensive. So we're paying for it once under the PCIA and then we're paying for it again, having to actually get it ourselves. So this whole fee that was created to prevent a cost shift to IOU customers has actually done the opposite and has now created a cost shift to, to all of us, to our customers. So collectively across um, all of the CCAs, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are being lost. And so this bill um, passes, we would be able to have a proportional share of the resources that we are already paying for. That's sort of the, the most important thing that it does. There's also a couple of other measures in the bill that would help lower the PCIA costs. So for example, um, John mentioned that it would uh, require the PUC to recognize the value of greenhouse gas free resources. Right now, those resources are not recognized as part of the PCIA costs, which means that the PCIA is artificially higher than it should be. So that's sort of another example of something this bill does. But I think that the main thing is that it allows us to get what we're paying for. And um, that's, you know, it's, it's when you look at it from that perspective, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and it's something that is our number one legislative priority this year. I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm happy to talk about it anymore. You did. Thank you very much. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I have, John, before I go to you, I just had a quick follow-up. I know you mentioned that a large group of people are supporting this. Is there any opposition to this that on record, any groups that have opposed or people that have submitted documentation? Yeah, that's, so, what, I gonna, that's what I was going to mention. And Gina, oh, okay. I was going to ask you. At last, at my last check, I have not seen any uh, organized opposition to it. The League of California Cities is going to come out with a support letter soon, but Gina may have additional information on that. We we had no opposition. Um, unfortunately, we now do have opposition, but it's it's from Southern California Edison. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll say that. Um, it's a little disappointing that they're opposing because this this bill is actually stems from a um, a, pub, a a proposal that we wrote with them at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, their um, you know their their reason for the opposition that they're stating publicly at least is that they think that this is um, really something that's better to be decided at the PUC, not something that should be decided in the legislature. And to be honest, we agree with that. But this proposal was with the Public Utilities Commission for 14 months, and they took no action on it. Um, you know, they didn't even consider it. And for us, it's very urgent that this gets decided. We're talking about a, a lot of money that our ratepayers are um, on the line for every month. Um, I'll note that on, um, I think it was last week, the Public Utilities Commission, in response to this bill, put out a um, a proposed decision on this proposal. Our view is that it was not a proposed decision that was thought out. It was completely in response to this bill in an attempt to make it go away. It punted most of the issues to future proceedings. So in reality, it didn't actually, it, it hasn't actually decided any of these issues still. It's kind of just an attempt to make this bill not happen. Um, but that's, that's the opposition we have right now. And that's the only opposition we have right now. Well, they were busy raising our rates and holding hearings on that. So I can understand why they might not have gotten to it. Um, anybody else have questions or comments? All right, um, Mary Sue, did you want to conclude the discussion? Sure. Make um, the motion, because I know you have brought sure. this. Sure. I, I just want to encourage my colleagues to support this. As you've heard, this is absolutely imperative that we get this equity um, one way or another, whether it's the PUC or through the legislature. And as Gina said, it's the top priority for CPA. Um, so I, with that, I move um, passage of a support letter for SB 612. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. 
Roll call, uh, roll call, please. Council Member Kraut? Aye. Council Member Shapiro? Yes. Council Member Weintraub? Yes. Mayor Protemauer? Aye. Mayor Busaja? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Okay, and we'll get that letter off as soon as we can. Thank you, John and Gina. Thank you. All right. Let's move along. Um, we're moving along kind of quickly. So um, I haven't heard anyone ask for a break. So we're just going to move on to item number nine, which is our last substantive item and certainly our most substantive substantive item. And that's the council consideration of a potential hazard or hero pay ordinance for frontline grocery restaurant and, and or hospitality workers. Um, our city attorney, Matt Summers, is going to present. And I noticed some hands going up. That's a good idea to get your hand raised now so that when we go to the public hearing, you can um, be called upon because once we're done with the public hearing, we're not gonna go back and forth. So it, uh, do it now and, and get it in the box uh, ready to go. So Matt, where are you? There you are, Matt, go ahead. Happy to Mr. Mayor. So I'll provide a brief oral staff report. And of course there's uh, further information in the paper packet that was available on the city's website. Tonight, the council is being asked to consider whether you want to direct staff to prepare a hero pay or hazard pay ordinance or an alternative approach to accomplish the same goal or not. Nothing will be adopted tonight as no ordinance yet exists. What is a hero pay? The hero pay ordinance that's been adopted by 24, 25 cities around the state are temporary wage increases for frontline workers. So far, about half of them have been large stores, so generally more than 300 employees nationwide and at least 15 at each location within the city, and it's been applied to grocery, retail, pharmacies. Some cities have made it just grocery, others have made it even yet broader to include uh, retail, restaurant, even hotel workers. The idea behind it is that a hero pay ordinance is intended to provide extra pay paid by the employer for frontline workers who have in the past uh, year since the pandemic started been continuing to serve the public yet not necessarily received extra pay for the additional risk they've taken on in continuing to keep grocery stores and the other sided stores open while uh, serving the public. Matt? Yes. I apologize. Um, Mary Sue is not in the meeting. Something happened. Oh, she goodness. She exited, and um, if we could just pause it a little bit until we yes, get her. Yes, of course. Back. We'll take a pause. I, I apologize for that. Is that the electronic thing over there again? The connection? We're not sure why she's All right. not one of the panelists. I, I texted her to join again. She yeah, it, it, I think there's a problem with the connection in there because it sometimes bounces her out. I'm sorry, Matt, to cut you off in the middle there. No, please. Um, a council member um, leaving the room is, is a reason to pause. Okay. If it's going to be a while, we could take a we could take our break. I, I hate to just have dead time on the air. Does anybody know what the problem is? I I didn't knock you off. You somebody, James, James, mute yourself. And what? Yeah. No. Should we just take a five minute break? Maybe that might be the right choice. A, a five minute recess would make some sense to get the technology. She got bounced off and she needs to get back on. There's a problem with the technical mm -hmm. thing. Let's take our break. We'll take five minutes. If the meeting goes really long, we can take another five minutes, but let's just take five minutes. I don't want to be dead time. Reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll be back in five.
Okay, I changed my name. I'm not Mary Sue, but it's uh, she's gonna sit here. <laughs> You know, I'm hearing up here, so I hope I can hear you. Yeah, I know. Council Member Maurer, I know you wanted a bigger office, but this is not the way to go about getting one. We're close. If staff could just let us know when everything's set up. Okay, James. Yeah, you guys are on there. You can go ahead and start on the second. One, one minute, please. Thanks. Okay. All right. Mr. May, are we waiting for the city manager to join? Too? He's here um, sitting beside me. So when he, when you want to talk. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you, you guys go ahead. When uh, you I'm, wanna... I'm fine. <laughs> well, well, I don't need to talk unless... You might uh, can't can't Kinden join from my office or David or P I mean can't he go in any of our other offices? He I don't think he can log on to this account. I'm on his account right now. He just changed my name. No, I know, right. but you can just log on through the email. I'll message him and stuff. He's right here. Do you want to try yeah, right on, we're, right on the, we're on the air? We're on the air, but Tony can you can just log on through your email. Oh uh, yes. Uh, Ryan will help. Well, maybe okay. I can do that. Yeah, well, Ryan can help him because you can log on we'll anywhere. Start on this and then we'll we'll have Ryan get me set up over there. Okay, so we can continue. Yeah, there's... you guys just continue, and then I'll be off in the off in the sides. Okay, and and I don't know what I missed. Nothing. We stopped. We paused. Why? Well, uh, Ken didn't have me pause with the staff report once we realized you had um, dropped out. And Ken, where's your um, speaker? These. All two right. Okay. I can't wait until we're back together again as a group. Oh my goodness. So hey, Mr. Mr. Mayor, have we re reconvened the meeting already? No, we haven't. No. Okay. I'm okay. still uh, sorry. Okay, um, uh, give me about, wait about five seconds and I'm gonna switch the audio back on, okay? I like this space. You're ready, go ahead. Okay, let's start the meeting up again. All right, I will reconvene uh, my staff report briefly. Thank you uh, all for the opportunity to solve the tech issue. So just as noted, hero pay ordinances are have been adopted by a number of jurisdictions around the state as an opportunity to provide additional pay to frontline workers, sometimes just grocery workers, other times broader set of retail, drug stores, pharmacies, um, and certain large retailers. The uh, ordinances that have been adopted have usually ranged between three and $5 extra per hour, uh, and have all been prospective except for one. City of South San Francisco went retroactive uh, 60 or 90 days back. The cities that have adopted them have all been threatened for a lawsuit by the California Grocers Association uh, they have filed several suits and only one has gotten in, in front of a judge. That would be the Long Beach Ordinance. And there the California Grocers Association sought a preliminary injunction to stop the ordinance from taking effect, but that was denied by a federal trial court. The suit still continues, but in the interim Long Beach has won and their ordinance remains in effect. Uh, no um, other case has yet proceeded to judgment nor trial and the um, CGA, CGA did send a letter to Calabasas threatening suit uh, as well, and that's available from the city clerk upon request. The other option is short of a, or different than a hero pay ordinance, 
that would require the grocers or retailers as selected to pay the extra funding. An alternative option would be for the city to use its portion of the federal stimulus money to provide additional pay to frontline grocery or other frontline workers. Uh, for example, on a three or $5 per hour basis on a reimbursement structure. That approach has been examined by a number of cities, not yet adopted, uh, but would, would be an option and was one of the particularly called out uses for the federal stimulus money that is being passed to cities. For those who are um, members of the public who aren't aware, in addition to the checks that were received by many individuals, the, most, the second round of the federal stimulus funding also included payments to local governments. Um, Calabasas is expected to receive approximately $4.4 million paid in two chunks, some this year, some next year. And uh, that money can be used for four things, responding to the public health emergency that is the pandemic, to, to respond to and provide additional pay to eligible workers, both within the city and privately, to provide government services to the extent of the city's reductions in revenue as a result of the pandemic, and to pay for investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. With that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, would the council like to hear from the public first or would you like to make your comments first? To hear from the public. Okay. Um, I would remind the public that once we get through the public comments and we turn to the council, we're not going back to the public. So I, you know, I would strongly suggest that if you want to make the public comments, to please raise your hands. I'm gonna go in the order I see them. And Mari, if I miss anybody or anybody calls in that I can't see, then please let me know. The first person is Matthew Plotkin. Please sta uh, state your, uh, well, I've stated your name. You can just name uh, your city of residence and you have three minutes. The timer is gonna go on. Go ahead, Matthew. Uh, my name is Matt Plotkin. I live in the city of Sherman Oaks and I work in the city of Calabasas. I have worked for Gelson's Market for almost 20 years, 12 of them at the Calabasas location. A lot of you don't know me or see me. I am the bookkeeper and I work behind the wall where you purchase your milk or yogurt. I am requesting that you pass a hero pay ordinance like the ones in LA City and LA County. This last year was one of the most emotionally and physically taxing years in my life. Before we fully understood this pandemic, I would ask myself on the way to work, am I going to catch a virus that's going to kill me? Am I going to pass a virus to someone I care about and kill them? Despite not knowing all the risks and before social distancing, my coworkers and I picked up extra days and hours to restock the shelves when our community bought everything. And I do mean everything. Today, I deal with a depression that I do not fully understand because this crisis continues. COVID is still here and people in our country are still dying. Just ask Michigan. Gelson's made and the grocery industry as a whole continues to make record profits and Gelson's being a late mover when it comes to social distancing measures and PPE. It took them months after standards were in place to provide plastic barriers between check stands. Even today, you can walk into the store and sometimes they forget to schedule a door guard slash people counter just to make sure people have their masks up and that the place does not get too crowded. Non-union leadership stopped appreciating your community as a customer a long time ago, but we did not. The long lines to check out and the wait times in our service deli have been getting worse well before COVID. Despite these leadership inefficiencies and the uncertainties this pandemic has provided, the hourly employees you have fostered relationships with over the years and that you continue to care about show up to work. If that is not heroic, I do not know what is. Hero Pay is an acknowledgement of our sacrifice and a statement from the community to be treated more respectfully as a customer. Gelson's needs to step up as a stakeholder in your community. Join your surrounding communities in supporting change for essential workers. Pass a Hero Pay ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for those heartfelt comments, Matthew. And thank you for your service. Um, excuse me, it's very small writing. Is it Arena Mercer? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Actually, it's uh, her husband, Ian Mercer, using her Zoom account. Ah, okay. Hello, Ian. Hi there. Thank you. Um, so this is Ian Mercer, resident of Calabasas. Um, evening to uh, Mayor Bazagian, Mayor Pro Tempora, and the members of the council. Uh, I'm here to speak in support of the agenda item regarding the Hero Pay Ordinance for frontline workers. 
having reviewed the, both the input from John Vitava of the Ralph's Grocery Store, the input from California Restaurant Association, California Grocers Association, all of whom are speaking in opposition to the premium pay ordinance under discussion, uh, several recurring points that I'd like to address. Firstly, and most eloquently, the opposition of these groups to the potential burden being passed onto the consumer resulting from any such ordinance passing is a travesty. Uh, if Calabas is one of the most affluent cities in the entirety of the United States can't bear the additional potential costs of our gratitude to those who worked within such stressful uh, situation, then, then who can? And how can we look each other in the eye when such other less fortunate cities are able to do so without hesitation? Secondly, it's no longer acceptable for corporations to operate on the backs of undervalued and underappreciated workers. Any business which claims that a temporary adjustment to worker compensation for hazardous working circumstances somehow makes their entire business model unfeasible does not deserve to exist as a business. I simply do not care how these corporations survive, take out a loan, negotiate with suppliers, reduce other overheads, or in the case of Ralph's, perhaps reduce your shareholder focus and consider your employees a higher priority. Um, Lastly, I'd like to request the council consider that throughout the pandemic, our frontline workers have been asked to compromise their own personal safety and the safety of their families to ensure that residents of Calabasas can continue to function. What right have we to demand their self for sacrifice without some consideration for reward as a token gesture of our appreciation? These individuals have endured hostile working environments, public ignorance, and the constant threat of infection. Would anyone, the council or members of the community participating this evening, place themselves willingly into that situation. And having done so, would you not expect some consideration from your community? I beg you to consider the people of this city, not just the bottom line of a faceless corporation. Uh, I thank you for your attention and I relinquish my time. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Kevin Sanchez. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, just state your uh, city of residence and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Kevin Sanchez, and I'm here to speak on item nine on behalf of the California Grocers Association and Calabasas Grocers. CGA respectfully asks you to not move forward with the grocery worker premium pay ordinance given the numerous negative consequences to grocery workers, neighborhoods, and the grocery industry. Based on the negative consequences experienced in other jurisdictions with similar ordinances, we must oppose the ordinance for both policy and legal reasons. We agree that the grocery workers serve a vital and essential role during the pandemic. They have worked tirelessly to keep stores open for consumers, allowing our communities to have uninterrupted access to food and medications. To protect our employees, grocery stores were among the first and continue to implement numerous safety protocols, including providing PPE and masks, performing wellness checks, enhancing sanitation and cleaning, limiting store capacity and, and instituting social distance requirements among other actions. On top of increased safety measures, grocery employees have also received unprecedented amounts of supplemental paid leave to care for themselves and their families in addition to already existing leave benefits. Grocers have also provided employees additional pay and benefits in various forms, including hourly and bonus paid, averaging an extra two to $3 along with other significant forms of support. Of all these safety efforts, <coughs> additional benefits clearly demonstrate grocers' dedication and appreciation for their employees. Most importantly, the industry has been fierce advocates for grocery workers to be prioritized for vaccinations. The grocery worker pay ordinance would mandate grocery stores provide additional pay beyond what is economically feasible with a nearly 30% increase in employment costs. This significant increase would severely impact store viability and result in increased prices for groceries, limited operating hours, reduced hours for workers, fewer workers per store, and most concerning, possible store closures. We respectfully implore the council to not move forward with the grocery work pay ordinance at this time. If council must bring the ordinance forward for a vote at this time, we ask you, you oppose its passage. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. And the next speaker, I just have the name Sloan, so please give your first and last name and city of residence. Hi, everybody. My name is Sloan Bulkwell. Um, I live in Encino, California. I've worked at Gelson's Calabasas for 23 years as a checker. My daughter, Kyla, has attended LVUSD since first grade and is currently a senior at Calabasas High. She has also worked as a bagger for Gelson's Calabasas 
for over a year now during this pandemic. We are both so lucky to be a part of this community and we are proud to serve you. This past year has been mentally and physically exhausting on all of us. But for me, my daughter and my fellow employees at fr and friends, it has been beyond description. I personally lost my father in March of 2020 as the pandemic hit. I have yet to properly grieve this because of the pandemic. My husband also lost his job due to this pandemic, which means me and my daughter had no choice but to go to work and to serve you guys as a community. I had to show up despite my fear, despite my stress, despite all of the, excuse me, I'm nervous, despite all of the chaos that was going on at my workplace. It was beyond stressful, huge crowds, impatient customers, distraught customers, and belligerent customers, all while trying to stay calm ourselves. We were not trained in how to handle a community in panic or how to handle a pandemic situation, but we all continued to show up every day. We tried our best to remain professional and calm despite not feeling safe or taken care of. We as workers and members of this community just wanna feel respected and appreciated. We deserve what our fellow employees in other cities are getting. Please know when considering this hero pay that all of these companies, Gelson's, Ralph's, Albertson's, et cetera, have made billions in profit. Gelson's alone was reported to have made 872 million in net profit for the year 2020 and was just sold. The Calabasas store is also currently going through a remodeling. They can afford this small request. It's the least that they can do. What if we hadn't shown up every day and yet we continue to do so? The conditions are still there. They haven't gone away. We still have long lines, distancing issues, masking issues, and belligerent customers. Thank you for considering this. Thank you. I guess that's our new system that just automatically cuts you off. I'm sorry, um, but you sounded like you were done. And I, I guess, Ari, that is that our new system that we just don't let people finish their sentence or? I really don't know what happened, Mr. Mayor. Okay. All right. We apologize that your last words, but we got the gist of what you were saying. All right. Um, I would remind you, I have two more speakers and then we're closing this. And so if you do intend to speak now, you need to tell us, because I'm not going to go back once we start the council discussion. Next speaker is David Juarez. You're, uh, please tell us your uh, city of residence and you have three minutes to speak. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is David Juarez. I am with the California Restaurant Association. I submitted a letter of opposition yesterday, so I won't repeat my comments too much, but uh, mandating restaurant employers to pay additional wages at a time when they are still struggling to survive will lead to additional closures. In the last year, about 30% of all restaurants in California closed either temporarily or permanently due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the related uh, government closures. So, uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, cities, cities like L.A., Long Beach, Santa Monica, West Hollywood, uh, L.A. County, the list goes on and on. They did not include restaurants in their hazard pay ordinances. So uh, for those reasons, I respectfully ask for a no vote on any item that requires employers to pay additional wages at this time. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, David. Final speaker is Rachel Torres. Rachel, you have the city of residence and then uh, three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rachel Torres. I'm the Deputy Political and Civil Rights Director with the United Food and Commercial Workers, Local 770. Um, I'm calling to express strong support for Hero Pay for grocery and drug retail workers. Um, as the previous speaker spoke, um, this is a limited policy in scope. Um, it only affects uh, large grocery and drug retail companies with 300 or more employees nationally um, with 10 on site. 
Um, as other speakers have mentioned, this policy has been passed in 30 cities, uh, over 30 cities throughout California and the state of Washington. Um, this, this policy has been vetted in the courts. Um, the California Grocers Association lost already twice um, in two respective hearings um, and have appealed those decisions. Um, they have not filed lawsuits in the majority of cities that have uh, passed this policy. Only three stores uh, owned by Kroger have um, threatened to close. Uh, about 98% of stores throughout California and Washington are paying the hero pay without incident. Um, this policy came about because of the high infection rate that grocery and drug retail workers have experienced throughout COVID-19, um, the detrimental and psychological impacts that they faced, the workers who have passed away. Um, they were put on the front line of COVID um, and not given proper PPE, not given on-site testing, not having proper paid and sick, sick days throughout the pandemic, not having the ability to quarantine um, outside of their homes, bringing the illness back to their families. Um, so this is the right and moral just thing to do. It only affects the companies that you would think it would affect, the large corporations who are already paying it throughout the region <coughs> and have the ability to do so. This does not affect the hours. Um, there is still a high demand for grocery and drug retail workers. Um, both for food and for access to the vaccine. Um, so that, that's already happening as we speak. The, the demand has not lowered, it's only increased. Um, and it's for temporary period of time. This is not a uh, increase indefinitely. Um, some cities have gone for 60 days, other cities have gone up to 120 days, I'm sorry, 180 days. So it's really within the jurisdiction of um, your city to decide what makes the most sense. But we strongly advocate this. It's, um, it, it's the right thing to do. It's the just thing to do. Um, and we, we really support this moving forward. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I have no other hands raised. Mari, has anyone called in? Any other hands that you see? No, Mr. Mayor, there are none. Okay, so I'm closing the public comment portion. I'm gonna turn to the council members. I'm gonna give Mary Sue the first crack because she uh, is the one who asked for this to be on the agenda. Let me just state though, because I think a number of uh, comments were made by the public. There is not an ordinance tonight. There's no parameters for one tonight. This is a discussion because we've never discussed this before. This is a discussion to discuss the possible bringing back of an ordinance and or alternatives. So um, nothing has been set. And tonight we're gonna discuss, debate, and then give direction to staff and if there's a consensus reached on something, it'll come back at a future meeting. So I just wanna make that real clear. Um, Mary Sue, you will go first, uh, go ahead. All right, thank you, Mayor Bazajian, and thank you for putting this on the council agenda so quickly. I have to start off my comments by saying, I was not aware when the hero pay passed in the city of LA and, and the unincorporated Los Angeles County and other cities that we were not included, I assumed otherwise. And when I learned that our workers in Calabasas who um, are as heroic as all the other grocery workers in the entire state and country were not recognized um, for their sacrifices, uh, I felt compelled to ask you to put this on quickly and you did, so I wanna thank you. Um, I also wanna add that like grocery workers, I'm an essential worker, my day job. Um, I went to work every day and continue to during the pandemic. The difference is this, I've been trained to work in disasters. I've been trained in responding to emergencies. I have staff working at the Cal State Vaccination Center since it opened. Grocery workers were not and really have not to date been given um, the training to, to work in such an environment. And I'll, I'll never forget when I would go into the grocery store late at night after work, um, there they would be working um, diligently and graciously and um, watching news reports of people threatening them because they were enforcing distancing or masking. I, I heard stories of our own residents um, really 
um, creating some very challenging situations. So I have a lot of empathy and um, a lot of respect for our grocery workers. Um, I want to just follow up with a couple questions that I have. Um, and Matt, I'll start with you. One of the speakers said that the Groceries Association has lost two hearings. I believe one was to prevent um, the hero pay from um, from happening. But what was the second one? Do you? Do you I'm know? not aware of the second one. I'm only aware of the one that was the Long Beach ordinance. Um, but uh, we can certainly find that, get more information on the second one. I want to let the public know we have um, received tremendous pressure um, and threats from the from the grocery um, association. And I'm sure other cities have too, but um, it is definitely something that um, they're really fighting. And, and, and by the way, I'd like for the record, we have received some letters of opposition from local grocery store chains. I know one is Gelson's and I believe the other is Ralph's. Um, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. The city has okay. received two letters, one Gelson's, one Ralph's. The city also received a letter from the California Grocers Association and the California Restaurant Association. Yes. Um, so when I asked for this to be put on the agenda, I really um, thought that the grocery workers, because they had never been shut down, um, were, were the ones that we would focus on. So um, I still feel that way. And um, I just wanted uh, to mention that. Um, the only other comments I have, um, I, I, I would strongly encourage my colleagues to find a way um, to show our grocery workers in Calabasas that we hear them, that we understand that this is um, an equity issue, that their colleagues at other stores have gotten a hero pay and they have not in Calabasas. And I would encourage all of us when we get to deliberations to talk about how we can do this. Um, whether it's 30, 60, 90 days um, during 2020, consecutive months of, of service, whether it's an hourly increase, three, four, five dollars um, during that period uh, for full-time workers and, and, and all part-time workers as well. Um, there's a number of different ways um, we can look at this, including uh, using the stimulus money, including asking the grocery stores to share costs with us. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. I, I think it's well deserving. It's just a matter of how we are going to do this. And once again, to all grocery workers watching and, and waiting to hear what the city of Calabasas will do, I want to let you know that you were heard um, and we're gr very grateful uh, for your commitment and your service and your sacrifices. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we, we can come back, if, we, we can have some back and forth, but so you, if you have other things to say, we'll go back. And I'll hit every council member too, by the way. Um, but I, I wanna go next. I wanna offer my thoughts on this because I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, I, I have to say that uh, I think the stimulus bill was a very, uh, it was profound timing because we were given basically four and a half million dollars by the federal government to stimulate the economy. And it comes with certain limitations and certain risks in, in what we do, but basically we have a pretty free hand to do things for the local economy. I think it would be um, very bad public policy to take the four and a half million dollars to stimulate the economy and then start regulating businesses that would force the businesses to suffer further losses than they've already had. Um, we have the money. We can certainly accomplish the goals that are in this hero pay slash hazard pay ordinances that have been considered. I, I think less than 5% of the California cities have actually enacted those ordinances. I will say just, just so everybody knows, I would never um, vote for an ordinance that would start wage controls um, on local businesses, unless I felt the businesses had done something onerous. But the goal is worthy. And speaking also as someone who was a, a former union president of a very large public sector union, 
I can tell you that oftentimes um, frontline workers do not get the attention and credit they deserve. So what I'm hoping comes out of this discussion is a way for the council to allocate a certain amount of that stimulus money to mirror what would be a hero pay or hazard pay ordinance without actually placing a burden on the local businesses. To me, that is a win-win situation. I do not think the local businesses would object to us using the money in that regard. There are ways to do it that are legal and that would have the same exact effect financially to the workers uh, with whom I sympathize uh, without uh, creating a bad precedent and without uh, harming the businesses. The details are going to have to be worked out. I would say that a couple of thoughts I have is that I, I would favor in general, because um, as long as we're discussing what might come back, I would favor in general uh, some kind of ordinance that would recognize people who uh, were working you know, during the height of the pandemic rather than people who are working later on this year who might get the benefit because it would defeat the purpose uh, of, of enacting such legislation. Another thought is, um, sorry to the management level employees, maybe it's my union background, but I wouldn't want, um, I mean, I mean for this to go to frontline workers and not necessarily um, corporate you know, managers or anything like that. No offense, but uh, they weren't necessarily in the same level of harm's way. Um, although I, I certainly would be amenable to, if they were, if they can demonstrate that, then maybe including them too. I would also say that uh, I, I would hope that we would look at expanding it possibly to other workers and in other industries. We had people in restaurants and fast food places that had interactions with hundreds of members of the public, strangers for long periods of time. And I think they could should be considered for inclusion. I think that hotel workers, people who clean the rooms and had to do the maintenance and had to be exposed to people from all over the country coming in and out, um, I think they should be considered as well for this. So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. I'm hoping they can be answered, but the bottom line is I would support an allocation of funds for this. It would, I would not support it in an ordinance form. I would support it coming from the stimulus money. And now that we've been told that's legal and that as long as we document it, we can do it. I don't see any purpose in enacting an ordinance as opposed to um, using the stimulus money. So uh, that's, those are my thoughts. I will now turn in order. I see Peter, your hand is up. And then Alicia and then David, your hand's not up, but I'm gonna go to you if you would like. So Peter, you're, you're up. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanna echo a, a few things here. First, I wanna start by saying thank you to all of our heroes out there. And yes, our grocery workers are definitely our heroes. Uh, when the pandemic hit and uh, we all had to get to the store and, and find a roll of toilet paper and we know how hard that was in the beginning. Uh, there was plenty of workers that were here in Calabasas taking care of us, and, and for that, I thank you, and we are grateful. Um, also, our restaurant workers, uh, our pharmacy workers, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, I want to point out, though, that the pandemic began in March of 2020, and here we are. It is April of 2021. Um, we're going to discuss this this evening, give staff some direction they'll come back with some sort of an ordinance for us to look at, uh, to decide on. The soonest that this could feasibly be enacted would be June, I figure. Um, we have a vaccine that's rolling out um, by June. I'm not sure that uh, you know we're, we're gonna be in the same level of threat that we were at the height of the pandemic last year. Uh, so I want to echo, echo the, the, the comments by Mayor Bazajian that uh, if we're going to honor our heroes, I want to honor the heroes that were there for us during uh, the pandemic, before the PPE was even, you know, understood. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a period of time during the pandemic, and I'm not even sure how to define this, when, uh, when it was really, uh, everyone was isolated, everyone was locked into their homes. Um, you know, we have to include the, the food delivery people, we have to include the restaurant workers. 
Uh, I'm not even sure how far we could possibly take it. I mean, Mayor Bazaggi mentioned the hotel workers. I, I agree that they were there for us, but uh, like the rideshare drivers, I'm not sure if they were, how essential they were and certainly how many people they're in contact with. Um, you know, our grocery workers and our restaurant workers were definitely there with hundreds and hundreds of strangers daily in their face um, on the front line. So how do, how do we draw that line? I'm not really sure. Uh, as far as ask, asking the businesses to increase their pay, uh, I just, I can't support that. Um, it's not a question of whether they can afford it or not, because they probably can't afford it. Uh, it's a question of, is it our job to regulate business? And certainly a number of the people that have written correspondence to us asking us to approve this tonight are already represented by collective bargaining agreements. And, uh, you know, it's the collective bargaining agreements. It's the union's role to, to participate in these discussions and adjust the pay as needed. Um, I don't really believe that that's our city's role in this instance here. Um, I would entertain uh, using our stimulus money to create some sort of a hero pay, um, back pay, bonus pay uh, for those heroes that were there for us during the pandemic and still are today. Uh, how that would be structured, I'd be open-minded to see what the staff can come up with, uh, but it would need to be allocated uh, fairly. And I would strongly support that we, you know, uh, provide the hero pay, especially to the people who were there in the beginning. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier about new hires. Um, you know, if, if somebody is just newly hired in uh, and is getting hero pay, uh, maybe, you know, the, the, the workers that were, you know, uh, on the front lines last year uh, need to be having that same treatment. I guess I'm starting to repeat myself at this point. So, I'm going to put a pin in it and let the rest of my council members speak. Um, that's fine. We we can go back. We'll we'll go back and forth because I think we're going to have to discuss discuss if I, a little bit of more direction. But I think we we're getting the general parameters of what everyone feels. Uh, Alicia, you're next, and then David, and then we'll go around to whoever. Alicia. Well. Um... So where to start? So I guess um, somewhat like uh, Mayor Pro Tem Maurer, when this was originally adopted by um, this LA County Board of Supervisors, it turns out it was only for unincorporated LA County. I think there was a lot of a misconception by some of us that we thought that it would include all of LA County. So many decisions during the pandemic have been decided by the county and then we find out they impact our community. But once we realized that this did not include Calabasas and we saw other cities um, adopting it and then we were approached by employees um, from one of our local markets, one that's very beloved in our community, um, I know that this was something that we all started talking about. There is no doubt in my mind that the employees at our supermarkets went to heroic efforts during the pandemic. Um, I mean, I can't believe it was a year ago when we were all stocking up and just the work that the, the employees did and how they were there every day. And when outbreaks were happening at the markets and there just was not a lot of information, they kept showing up and they showed up for our community. And I think that's what makes this more difficult because we love our grocery store employees just as much as the city of Los Angeles does. And we want to show our appreciation for their work. I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind. I guess the question is, are, is the mandate then going to be on the grocery stores or is it something that we are going to do through the federal stimulus or some creative Calabasas way? And I would my inclination is doing something using the stimulus money by actually showing that this is coming from us. I think it's hard for a city to dictate what a business can do, but we absolutely can control this spending. And it's really then showing our appreciation for the employees. 
And I think at the end of the day, as long as the employees are receiving compensation, it doesn't matter which party is paying. I think we would have to develop criteria that the employees worked during the height of the pandemic. They can't be recent hires um, because we want this to be reflective of what they endured um, last year. But staff can work on that, but I'm absolutely in support of our city acknowledging the work and how we can, um, what we can do to support them. I mean, we got very creative when we had our small business grant program. We wanted to help the businesses. And now I think it's our turn to show our appreciation for the employees. I would like it to focus on grocery store employees. We did the notice, the employees were made aware. I don't even wanna have a conversation that involves um, restaurants right now without the restaurants. They weren't noticed to the level that I would have wanted. So I don't wanna have a conversation that doesn't involve them. But I would really like right now to focus on the grocery stores. We've received lots of correspondence. We've been engaging with the employees, the store corporate and CGA, but I think anything we can do as a community to show our appreciation. I mean, we have a, I always say that our daytime employees count just as much as our rest as our residents. And this is just an example of the way we're showing our appreciation for our daytime employees. Okay, David. Thank you, and <laughs> boy, I'm getting yelled at already everywhere. All right, um, I want to join my colleagues in thanking very much everybody, all the frontline workers, everybody who worked during this this past year and continues to work. Uh, I know many of the employees who who wrote us letters. We there, in addition to the five or six who spoke tonight, we have hundreds of, of letters and, and indications of individuals, residents, uh, customers, and staff members at various businesses in the city. And I know them, they know me, they know all of us uh, because they are part of our community and, and we thank and appreciate them tremendously. So I'm glad this is on our agenda. I have some comments which also mirror some of the discussions and sentiments already raised normally I, I've already, I've said it, I'll say it again. I don't generally like our city to be telling businesses or individual businesses what to do. Uh, and it's not generally, in my view, our position to control them. I, I agree with the mayor on that exactly. Uh, but again, this is a very unique time. Once in a hundred years, we have, we have a pandemic like this and going on can you hear me i'm sorry yes i'm sorry now we got can. Off. okay once in a hundred years something like this has come up so i think taking action such as we're talking about tonight is important and necessary um i i would think if we're going to talk about it think about those who are going to support again i agree with majority of my colleagues we're talking about individuals who were there in the last year, or who worked in 2020, and maybe in the beginning of this year as well. I'm not looking uh, in my mind to put forward, if we're talking about stimulus funds uh, in particular, to anyone who necessarily who's just starting. I'm looking at those individuals who did work during the most difficult times and put themselves on the lines for everyone in this community. And they really did, and they continue to do so. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, and one of them is for Matt, maybe to explain a little carefully, more carefully, that uh, the stimulus pay, uh, the, highlight the section in the stimulus pay that allows us to use these funds for this purpose, that's for the public, that's a little more clearly. And the other is, do we, I, I know we've received it, but is there something that could be reported to us about what other or maybe going forward, what other grocery stores in our city in Calabasas have done? Maybe we can have a chart or something like that coming back to us or information. We have that, maybe the public should see that as well, unless it's confidential for any reason. Um, I am supportive of grocery store employees 
those who worked in, in the store, whether they're management, full, part-time, that if they were in the stores, I think we should be considering them. Um, so I am supportive of that. I'm also willing to support the consideration of using stimulus pay rather than mandating the stores do that themselves and cover these funds. Uh, thank you. Okay, Matt, did, did, I think he asked you to highlight the section and then the rest of it um, we can come back to. Do you have a section there that you can highlight? Um, yeah, so it would be, it's part of the, um, the Stimulus Act requirements and it is intended to allow the city to choose to use a portion of the funds to provide to workers performing essential work, both on the public side and on the private sector side um, and the premium pay is up to an additional $13 per hour with a $25,000 per worker cap um, above their existing wages. And uh, not that necessarily we'd be going that high per worker, mindful of the uh, uh, many folks who would be who would have a call on those funds. And we could provide, certainly would provide, hearing the council's comments tonight, that it, a assessment of options that would be legal to focus the money uh, were it to be used with stimulus funds on folks who worked during the height of the pandemic and not folks who enter the workforce now uh, but did not work during the height. That's a bit of an open question, but we would certainly take a look at that and sort out how best to accomplish that goal. All right, David. Uh, the other question that David had was regarding the letters, and I believe the letters and the charts and whatever else was sent to us is all part of the public record. Did you want that posted somewhere, David, if it's not already? I think it's, yes, I would like it uh, posted it, if my colleagues would as well. I think it would be good for the public to see what has been done. A lot of our stores and, and have done things for the workers as is wonderful and they should get be applauded and get uh, the accolades right. and credit for that. Mari, I think it is, is it posted yet? Yes, it's, it has, everything we've received has, has been posted except for some postcards that I, Michael McConville, excuse me, Michael McConville just sent to me. So okay, those will be posted postcards. tomorrow. The postcards yeah. from the workers and the union and then the Gelson's letter, which I think arrived late, all of that, just make sure all of it gets posted you yeah. know, on all sides and we'll continue to post so that the public can see it. Right. Gelson's um, is posted already. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. I didn't check. All right. Mary Sue, you had your hand up again. Yes. As yeah. um, I'm so uh, proud of our city and our council for um, agreeing that uh, this is the right thing to do. I would like, um, as, as those that are listening, um, and particularly the grocery workers, you're hearing that right now the next step is, to, is the how. How are we going to do this? If you have any suggestions on how, you've heard us talk about you know, months parameters or cert working at a certain time last year, or um, there's just a lot of different variables, but now we have to make sure that we are fair and equitable in, in moving forward. And so I would encourage you if you have any suggestions on uh, how we should approach this, um, that Kinden, would it be okay if you were the recipient of, of emails, um, our city manager, you could um, send them to him. And um, I just, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I, there were 165 cards that we received tonight. I think that the stakeholder group, the union should be involved in kind of their ideas as well. Um, the grocers could be a good partner in implementing. As uh, Council Member Weintraub mentioned, we had a plan for small businesses that were the businesses applied. Um, could the grocers help us um, confirm time periods of employment, full or part-time. It's it, There's gonna be some work ahead of us and um, a partnership and uh, of all stakeholders. So I wanted to um, thank our workers again and thank my colleagues. Okay, thank you, Mary Sue, for bringing it to the council's attention. I um, I know I gave you a hard time at first. Yes, I, you did. I just want to admit <laughs> that on the air for a lot of reasons. One of which is that I'm gonna tell the council we are really are jam packed. I mean, yeah, we're going to have a timing issue. We're going to have a long meeting schedule in the next few meetings. But 
The good news is we may need a little time, a couple of weeks to go through this. Kendon, um, you've heard some of the feedback. For the next step would seem to me to be to have staff, a couple staff members, um, take all the gamut of suggestions. It sounds like the council is pretty much in favor of doing this and the majority or maybe even all of us lean toward the, the stimulus money being used. And then coming up with a cogent plan that we can actually do in a resolution form and approve it in meeting. So do you need a couple council members on a subcommittee or do you want the staff to take a crack at it first? How would you like to proceed? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think uh, first uh, a couple matters of clarification. I just want to make sure that there's consensus from the council that the focus right now is on grocery workers. Is there any other workers that we want to um, uh, uh, address in this first draft? I mean, this might come back to council in, in, in subsequent um, um, uh, reviews or considerations, but is the, the primary focus right now grocery workers? I, I think that's correct. I, I had wanted more, but um, I, I didn't hear a consensus for that. So I, I, I can't say that my, my one, <laughs> one man view should be imposed. I feel bad for the workers that did have to clean the floors and and uh, you know serve the fast food and all that because I think they were in harm's way too. But whatever, we'll focus on the grocery workers for now. Um, I think that was a consensus from my colleagues. And Peter, did you have something you wanted to add right now? I was just going to concur that uh, I, I would like to see this cover more than just grocery workers. But I think for expediency, we should focus on the grocery workers first and uh, see where that gets us. Okay, and as long as we're, by the way, I should point out to the council, because a couple people that make public comments were assuming ordinances in other cities, which we can't assume. As long as we're using stimulus money, we don't have to limit it to Ralph's, Gelson's, whatever. It can be some of the smaller, you know, mom and pop, you know, stores to the extent there are any that are, that are serving food, like, you know, I don't know, Erewhon, I don't know if Erewhon would normally be included in this or not. They may or may not qualify, but that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, we need to sit down and look at the whole scope of what's affected, get the stakeholders involved. So Kendon, um, you, uh, so the answer is yes. For now, I guess grocery workers, however you want to define, I would define grocery stores as including like Erewhon and Trader Joe's, of course. And I don't, I think Albertsons, Ralph's, um, Gelson's and Rite Aid would be the only other ones I can think of. Is there anyone think of any others in our community? Did you say Rite Aid? Well, yes. Okay, so we're going beyond grocers. Well, well think, all I the ones that had groceries that I, all the ordinances oh, I've seen oh, have, have see. Rite Aid, CVS, have the, correct, Matt? They all had those retailers as well. Uh, most of them, I'm not sure I'd say all, but most of them have picked up uh, they tend to define it as grocery or drug stores. So that picks up CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, things like that. We have one. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. What about you? Then you have the pharmacies within the grocery stores. So I think right. we can leave that to staff to come back with some options to, you know, see what was actually open. I mean, some places were doing just curbside for the pharmacies. I think we just have to understand. We all know the grocery stores were open with regular operations. So I think we just have to find out more details for some of these others. Okay, so so that that what other questions did you have, Kenton? No, that was the main one, um, Mayor. Then I think the other thing we'll do is um, we will work with us on staff. If, if there is council that would like to put input in, I, we'd welcome that, but I don't know if we need to create a subcommittee just for efficiency. I think that might be a little bit more difficult to coordinate schedules. Okay. But I, I, I do appreciate your input and suggestions. And Mayor Pro Tem, I think you know any emails that come from uh, some of our workers, we'll take those um, those ideas into consideration as well. If you find that you need council members' input, like a subcommittee, then put it on the twenty eighth to appoint for us to appoint. We'll do, and that way we can appoint on the twenty eighth. I I would hope that if we can draft something, that we might slip it in on the agenda on May 12th. I, I know that's a busy meeting, but but let's see how busy it is. Maybe maybe we won't get to West Village by then. It's possible they, they don't finish their work. 
but we we are place holding that entire meeting for West Village right now. Mari, you'll let us know. Um, anything else, Kendon? No, that's it, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you. Okay, that was wonderful. We actually have con consensus. I, I'm so happy. Okay, I mean, I don't sound happy, but I'm happy. All right. Um, informational. Uh, anything else from anybody? No. All right. Informational reports. Thank you to the public who came. It really did uh, help us with all your letters and your comments. I appreciate it from all different sides. Okay. Informational reports. Check register. Any questions regarding the check register? Okay. Task force reports. David. Thanks. I'll be quick. I already announced the uh, attended chamber attorney forum where we're going to have law day on April 30th, as already mentioned. I attended SCAG, the CHD, the legislative committee where we where we discussed uh, legislation, including the one we discussed tonight, uh, the regional council meeting. I also attended the Valley Economic Alliance Workforce and Education Committee meeting and we will be coming forward with another job fair with jobs for those who need them. And that's certainly a welcome item. And the, tomorrow, Friday morning, I'll be attending the League of California Cities Policy Committee. Uh, and for all of us who are interested, the SCAG General Assembly this year uh, is virtual, like many other things, but we can all attend and it's on May 6th. So if you're interested, I know we can all sign up for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Peter? Yeah, just a real quick announcement that uh, the mayor and myself attended the Chamber of Commerce uh, Executive Board meeting, and I'm excited to let everybody know that the Chamber of Commerce is getting uh, their uh, plan for 2021 together. Uh, we should be seeing a lot of action out of them uh, coming up here. And uh, if you remember the Chamber of Commerce and your membership uh, might have lapsed over the last year or so, I would just strongly encourage you to... Uh, to get those dues paid and be part of the fund because I think they're gonna have a great year coming up here. Okay. Um, anyone else on task force reports? I have okay. one. Oh yes, Alicia. Um, Peter and I as part of the homeless subcommittee task force, we met with, um, it was a rather large meeting, but it was Kinden, Gabriel, Graham, who is our homeless outreach coordinator for the COG, John Bingham, let's see. We had a lot of people on the call. I'm trying to think at this point, but um, it was uh, trying to bring Peter up to speed about some of the efforts that are taking place in this community, in the community. And I think after that meeting, we realized that we need to do maybe a progress report or update to the entire council. So that's something that we can work with Kinden on, and then that will allow the community to know some of the things that we're working on, some of the resources that are out there, um, some of the resources that are out there for homeless individuals and for the community. So, and also, yes, um, Deputy Mason DiMatteo was on the um, call as well. So maybe when our agenda um, lightens up, we can do a status report for the entire council and for the community about resource and Michael McConville, sorry, I'm like thinking um, he's such a great asset um, and I'm helping with this. So we'll get that to the, the council and the public. Okay, Mary Sue. I just wanted to mention that the Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy has received $12 million in wildfire recovery and um, prevention funds. It's for shovel ready projects. Uh, the deadline is in a couple months. It's for this fire season. Um, so hopefully our city or our COG area, um, since it covers all the, the COG cities, um, will be putting forth some grants. And I just uh, I, I just learned today that the League of California Cities is definitely going to be in person this year in its annual convention in Sacramento. So that's in September. And the Contract Cities one, as you know, has been moved to September its annual convention just for this year. Um, okay, uh, I don't have anything else on that. Um, future agenda items. Does anybody have a future agenda item that we haven't already discussed? 
I'd like to get, uh, and I think I mentioned this last time, but I'd like to make the formal request that we have a discussion item uh, in the near future on how to best utilize our, our commissions. I think uh, we have some great people that have volunteered in the city that have experience and, and uh, education and, and a lot of history in things like the environment and telecommunications and historic preservation. And I think they're being seriously underutilized and I'd love to come up with a plan on how to best uh, let them participate more strongly in what we do here. Okay, uh, we'll put that on in the future, Mari. Um, I'm thinking if something happens, we don't hear West Village on May 12th, can we put it on that agenda? And if not, we'll try for May 26th, okay? Fair enough. Anything else, anybody? I, have, I just want to just tell the public what's coming up. Uh, April 28th, we are discussing the uh, memorandum of understanding that has been proposed by the property owners of Calabasas Village and uh, between them and the city of Calabasas. That is likely to be a long discussion, as is um, the city's position on redistricting. So those are two fairly lengthy discussions for the next meeting. On May 12th, as I alluded to, we have set that aside for discussions on West Village if it's ready to come before the council. And that will also be at least one, one whole meeting. And on May 26th, we, have, we will put on the agenda a request by the Chamber of Commerce for financial assistance using some of the stimulus money, which we have in our public memo. Uh, it has been stated that it is appropriate to consider that for usage. So those are the items coming up. All right, I don't have any other items of business, so it is now 9 o'clock p.m. and we will adjourn much earlier than I thought we would tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you all.